Hello and welcome to this webinar. This webinar about the standards of practice and in particular standards of practice number five, relationships with patients. My name is Caroline Morris. I am the Deputy Registrar and Registration Director at the College. I'm a medical radiation technologist myself and I'm registered in magnetic resonance and in radiography and I have almost 40 years of experience in the industry. The webinar today is one of a series of sessions that is focused on the standards of practice. We're going to cover today in the presentation what the role of the CMR ITO is, what Practice Standard 5 includes, the principles of communication, and some communication guidelines that will provide you with some handy tips and tricks to help you optimize your communication relationships with your patients. In this webinar, um, I want to just explain the terms that we're using. Uh, so for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to be referring to patients. Now, there are many concepts uh, today around patient-centered care that have evolved. And so you might have heard about person-centered care. Um, you also may have heard about family-centered care. Um, and so the family would include anybody that the patient identifies as being significant in their life. Um, and so in the purposes of this presentation, we will be using the word patient, but we are referring and intending that that word patient would apply to both person and family centered care as well. Before we get into the main part of the presentation today, I'd like to suggest that you go to the CMRITO website and under the resource section in publications, you'll be able to access a number of documents that we're going to be referencing during our presentation. During our discussions today, we're going to be using the standards of practice, the code of ethics, and a what you must know about communicating with patients. These three documents will form the bulk of our presentation and conversation today. Who is the CMRITO and what is the role of the organization in Ontario? The CMRITO or College of Medical Radiation and Imaging Technologists of Ontario is the licensing body for medical radiation technologists and diagnostic medical sonographers in Ontario. It is mandatory for both of those groups of individuals to be registered with the CMRITO in order for them to legally be able to practice in Ontario. And we are responsible for regulating the practice of medical radiation technologists and diagnostic medical sonographers in accordance with two pieces of legislation, the ones that you see on the screen. Our mandate and role is to protect the public interest, and we do that by ensuring that the medical radiation technologists and diagnostic medical sonographers who are issued certificates of registration are qualified to practice and are practicing professionally. And we do that by setting to entry to practice standards and by setting standards of practice for the profession. The CMRI here regulates five specialties, but we are one profession, medical radiation and imaging technologists. We issue certificates of registration to members in radiography, nuclear medicine, radiation therapy and magnetic resonance, and most recently, diagnostic medical sonographers. Establishing standards of practice for the profession is one of the key responsibilities for a regulator. The standards that we have in place at CMRITO were developed in consultation with registrants. And from time to time, when the standards need to be updated, registrants are engaged in that process. Our current standards of practice contain eight separate standards, and they set the minimum expectations for practice for our registrants to ensure that we are able to provide safe and ethical care to our patients. The standards of practice also includes the scope of practice statement, which describes the profession of medical radiation and imaging technology in the scope of the practice of the profession. The controlled acts that have been authorized to medical radiation technologists to perform under the Medical Radiation and Imaging Technology Act are also included in the standards of practice. And these effectively then set the expectations for the professional practice of registrants of the college. It helps us understand what each registrant is accountable and responsible for and sets performance criteria for registrants and is also useful in interpreting the practice of the profession, both for the public and for other health professions. 
The second document I'm going to be referencing today in this presentation is the Code of Ethics. Now, the Code of Ethics sets out ethical indicators regarding expectations for medical radiation and imaging technologists to act in the best interests of patients. And as such, sets out a series of principles that outlines what responsible conduct and ethical and moral behavior expectations are for registrants of the CMRITO. So, with all of that preamble dealt with, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this particular presentation, which is around standard number five, relationships with patients. Now, what does this standard actually include? Of all of the standards of the college, the one that I feel I've got the closest affinity to is standard number five, because the focus is on patient care. I would suspect that for many of you, you'll have a similar sentiment. Standard five is about creating relationships with our patients that have got clear and professional boundaries. It's about making sure that we manage those relationships with dignity and respect. And that we've got the necessary knowledge, skill and judgment to avoid causing unnecessary harm, pain or distress to our patients. It's also about making sure that we're providing our patients with the information that they need to make informed decisions about whether they want to proceed with procedures and respecting the choices that they make. And lastly, the standards and the various indicators in there are about protecting and keeping confidential the information that you have about your patients. 15 indicators in standard five I think can be grouped into three main categories for the purposes of explanation. And the first revolves around providing information and answering questions to assist our patients to be able to provide informed consent. And if the questions they're asking are outside of our scope, preferring their patient to where they can get the answers they need. And that group is the group that's here reflected in green. The second group is the group that's reflected in purple. And that is about assessing our patients. And that's about the reason we do that is to make sure that we're able to modify our procedures and tailor the procedure to their particular needs. We want to ensure we maintain the dignity of our patients by instructing them to only remove the necessary clothing and items and making sure that we cover the patient whenever we can. The second group also involves explaining what you're going to do and where you need to touch the patient and why and obtaining consent to continue before you do anything. And then the last grouping revolves around confidentiality. So that's confidentiality of patient information and compliance with the legislation that's di directly related to the standard. And in this diagram, you can see the relationship of how those pieces of legislation tie to each of the three groupings that I've just described. The next question I want to address in our discussion today is why is effective communication so important to medical radiation technologists and diagnostic medical sonographers? The role that medical radiation technologists and diagnostic medical sonographers play in the healthcare services today is essential. We are there to provide diagnostic imaging and therapeutic services to patients. And by the very nature of the work that we do, the times that we are offering those services to patients is usually during extreme challenging and emotional times for those patients. Ensuring that our communication between us and our patients is effective is essential so that we can provide care that makes sure that our patients stay safe and that we can achieve effective and ethical outcomes. I'd like to perhaps take a moment and think about this from the patient's perspective. While you and I accept that technology is at the center of our practice, for patients, the environment and the experience can be very depersonalizing. In most of our procedures, both diagnostic and therapeutic, patients are required to remove their clothing. They go into rooms that are very dimly lit and are often extremely noisy. And the rooms are filled with these large and complex equipment. Patients are to undergo uncomfortable and sometimes painful procedures, um, by, if they need to have an injection, for instance. And many of the procedures could be embarrassing for patients. Uh, on top of that, we're asking them to hold still or maintain an awkward position for what is often a very lengthy period of time. Couple that with the fact that they're already anxious before they come because they're afraid of what we're going to find. 
the level of anxiety that a patients experience in our departments can easily be overlooked um, when, if we focus on the technology and not on the patient. Another factor in why effective communication is so important is because of the increasing voice of patients in healthcare today. There's a number of movements of patients where they've created their own associations. Governments have appointed ombudsmen. And there are a number of initiatives that are showing that patient and family-centered care is a priority. A lot of this work began back in 2010 with the Excellent Care for All Act. And since then, patient advocacy has continued to be a driving force in healthcare and is still extremely relevant today. Now that we've talked about why effective communication is so important, let's look at some strategies for success. So let's talk a little bit about the principles of communication. And here I'd like to focus on active listening. Now, what is active listening? Well, active listening is a way of listening and responding to another person that improves the mutual understanding between the two parties involved in the communication. It also helps us in recognizing somebody else's perspectives and feelings and helps us appreciate them. Additional concepts related to active listening is the concept of empathy, where you don't only show, uh, listen to somebody's words, you actually show them that you care about them and their thoughts and feelings and are willing to actually give them time to hear them out, which leads to promoting respect and dignity for the individuals that you are communicating with. And lastly, it's about being present and engaged in that moment, being truly present in that moment. Our data demonstrates that the majority of the complaints that are received by CMRITO relate to communication breakdowns and not about the competence of our members. In any interaction or communication, there are three aspects, a sender, a receiver, and the message that's passing between those two individuals. Now, MRTs are on the role of a sender when they inform patients about the procedure and what they're going to do. And the information that you're sharing with the patient is the message, where in that circumstance, the patient is the receiver. But when you are checking with the patient to confirm that the patient has understood the procedure or the patient is busy consenting to the procedure, you're actually in the role of the receiver. And so effective communication involves that sharing of information with each person in that interaction, moving between the role of sender and receiver. Now, experts in communication have determined that 97% of communication is nonverbal and only 7% is actually about the words that we say. So an awareness of nonverbal communication is vital in order to make sure we've got effective communication. And there are many factors that contribute to the patient's ability to be able to receive and understand what we're saying. The nonverbal content of our communications includes things like our facial expressions, our body mo movement and posture, the gestures we make, the eye contact we make, whether we touch the patient, how we touch the patient, um, and the space that we have around us. In terms of vocal content, it's not always about uh, how you say it. The pace of your speech and the tone of your inflection can also convey many messages. And patients will more often listen to how something is said than actually what is said. Patients can therefore very easily pick up on a negative tone of voice and be quite anxious and, and suffer some misapprehensions if they're in that situation. So when interacting with patients, we need to make sure that we are using our eye contact appropriately, we're exhibiting the caring attitude and using body language that communicates openness. We need to keep in mind that the effective communication not only involves that message that we're delivering, but also the, the way that that message is received and understood. I think our conversation so far has demonstrated how complex communication is. In addition to all this complexity, there are also a number of barriers that we need to be aware of that do affect our communication. Some of these barriers are barriers that we don't have control over, but some of them are, and the ones that we can actually make a difference to. So the first one I think would be some of our attitudes. Uh, 
negative stereotyping of patients, a lack of understanding about their needs or situation, making assumptions about people or judging people based on their abilities. Those are all things that are within our control to change. Being under time pressure is perhaps one that we don't have as much control over because we're always in a hurry. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to take that time to explain fully or take the time to listen and fully communicate with our patients. We can also be guilty, I think, sometimes of focusing on the procedures and the equipment rather than the patient. These are all things that we need to be keeping in mind if we want to try and optimize our communications with our patients. There are other factors that are outside of our control that we need to work around, and those would be things like organizational and environmental factors. Organizational factors are things like um, rigid appointment times that don't leave you a lot of time for um, patient care, but focus really on throughput rather than on patient care. Lack of communication sometimes amongst members of the healthcare team. Environmental factors that are inherent to our situations and our environments where we work. Noise from the equipment and in therapy departments make it extremely hard to hear. Lack of space, no privacy for discussions with patients. The fact that many of our MRT stand at a distance from patients when they're actually um, performing the procedure. So it makes it difficult for patients to hear. Um, our rooms are typically in low levels of lighting, which makes it hard to see people's faces and expressions. And of course, masks are, make it extremely difficult to see anything that's going on in somebody's face, never mind seeing what is happening with their facial expressions and with their lips. So these are all barriers that we need to, need to find, try and find ways to work around to ensure that we can keep up our effective communication. Recognizing how complex communication can be with our patients, the CMRITO has developed communication guidelines to help our members. These communication guidelines are available on our website and that's the third document that I was referencing at the beginning of my presentation that I thought would be helpful information for you as you proceed through. These guidelines form one of a series of guidelines that we put together for registrants called What You Must Know About. And this one is focused on communicating with patients. Now what this document provides is guidance on establishing a professional and caring relationship with your patients. At this point, I thought it might be helpful to explain the relationship between the standards, the ethics and the guidelines and how they all fit together. And for this purpose, in the What You Must Know About Communicating with Patients, on pages 11 to 13 of that particular document, there is a series of tables that explain how the um, standards, the ethics, and the communication guidelines relate to each other. For the next part of this presentation, I would like to consider and review with you the information that's in the communication guidelines um, to help you develop your relationship with patients and improve your communication. And what I'd like to do is consider those communication principles and guidelines that are in the document from three perspectives. We're going to look at it from what happens before you do the procedure, during the procedure, and then finally after the procedure. As we consider from before the procedure, we're going to look at some tips and tricks that might improve those communications with your patients from four different perspectives. We're going to look at the introductions, the ethical considerations, how to provide information on what to expect, and obtaining consent. The first step in our interaction with the patient is to establish a professional relationship, and that starts with our introductions and greetings. So if you can greet your patients, and maybe there's a caregiver with them, in a welcome manner, maintaining a positive attitude, with good eye contact, and introduce yourself to the patient. And tell them a little bit about your profession and what it is that you're going to be doing. Um, many facilities use a nod procedure, N for the name, O for the occupation, and D for what you're going to do. You may also want at this point introduce anybody else who might be present for the procedure and explain what their role is going to be in the procedure and ask your patient whether they have any concerns or objections to having any other individuals being present in the room. 
uh, it's so important to check with your patient how they would like to be addressed. Um, and if in doubt, be more formal. They can always ask you to be less formal. But don't use colloquial expressions like dear or sweetie. Um, patients will often find that offensive. It's also important to clarify the role of anybody else who's present and ask the patient if they would like their person to be involved in their procedure. The Code of Ethics also have some ethical considerations that you need to take into account as you start this professional relationship with your patients. And they're really around respecting the dignity, privacy and autonomy of your patient, making sure that your boundaries for your professional relationship with them are very clear and appropriate, and making sure that you treat all patients equitably, regardless of where they come from, what color, what ethnic origin, what sex, what sexual orientation, gender identity, or family status or disability they may be displaying. Now that the introductions are out of the way and you've established a positive relationship, professional relationship with your patients, the next step is to provide some information. You want to provide some information on what the patient can expect when they're having their procedure done. And so you want to encourage the patient and their caregiver to participate where appropriate. Make sure that you're respecting their choices and perspectives, because remember, you're the expert on performing the procedure or the treatment, but the patient is the expert on themselves and their body. Be aware of, again, of that all those principles we discussed in the last section around your tone of voice, your nonverbal behavior, and ensuring that you've got those effective communication happening by messages being sent and received between you and the patient and their potential caregiver. Before we move on to actually performing the procedure, we need to discuss an important component of any procedure, and that is obtaining consent. The standards of practice and the code of ethics both have indicators that relate to your requirement as a healthcare professional providing services to patients to make sure that you have consent from the patient before you carry out any diagnostic or therapeutic procedure. It's important to recognize and realize that consent is not a single event. It's not an event where a patient signs a consent form and consent has been obtained. Consent is a process. So even if a patient has signed a form, that consent could be withdrawn at any time. Consent needs to be obtained before the procedure begins. And whether it's right in writing or verbal, whatever your processes are at your particular facility, but it needs to be obtained before the procedure starts. And don't assume that you don't need to get consent if the patient has had this procedure done before. To obtain informed consent from a patient, there are a number of um, components that need to be explained to the patient with an opportunity for their patient to ask questions about the information. And the information that the patient needs to get about the process is information about the nature of the procedure, what the expected benefits, risks and side effects of the procedure could be, if there are any alternatives that they should consider or could consider, and what would happen if they decide not to move forward with this particular procedure? Consent is often obtained from the patient before they arrive at a diagnostic imaging department, but it's important that you ensure that that patient has understood what is gonna to happen to them when they have that procedure and respect the autonomy of the patient should the patient decide that they don't want to continue or proceed with the procedure. Now that we've established a professional relationship with our patients and we've provided information on what to expect and obtained consent to proceed with the procedure, we now move into the, the during the procedure phase. And here we're going to consider patient assessment before the procedure, touching principles, how to maintain that professional relationship during the procedure and what patient supports you can offer. Both the standards of practice and code of ethics have indicators specifically focused on assessment of the patient in order for you to be able to determine and develop an individualized comprehensive procedure for that patient that would keep them safe and that is based on their physical, medical and emotional needs, um, taking into account their values and cultural background. Now that you've completed the assessment of your patient and have determined the optimal process that you wish to use 
to be able to perform the procedure or treatment on the patient, the next step is going to be positioning your patient for that procedure or treatment. The stands of practice have a number of indicators that set out the expectations for what you are required to do in order to provide the service to the patient. Their touching principles are important for you to consider as you move forward with positioning the patient. First and most important one being talking before you touch. Never assume that the patient has given you permission to move forward unless you've actually got consent from them to be able to do so. It's important that you explain to the patient when and where you are going to touch them and why you're going to touch them and only touch them where it is necessary for the procedure in order for you to position the patient or perform the treatment. Each patient is a unique individual, and so you need to make sure that you're respecting their cultural and physical needs. You also need to make sure you're creating a safe environment and maintaining the dignity and respect of a patient by making sure that you cover them with a gown or a sheet where you've had to remove clothing. The RHPA has got a number of requirements around the prevention of sexual abuse and complying with these touching principles will ensure that you continue to deliver services with a high degree of integrity and effectiveness. Now that you've explained everything to the patient and have consent to move forward with the procedure and consent to touch the patient, the next step is going to be performing the procedure. And during that procedure, you want to make sure that you maintain that professional relationship that you established when you first introduced yourself to your patients. So it's important that you con continue to not be over familiar or dismissive to the patient, that you try and speak to them at their same level of eye contact if at all possible and maintain their dignity and keep them as comfortable as possible throughout the procedure, making sure to cover the patient if you in fact have had to remove any clothing. There are a number of active communication strategies that you can employ to provide your patient with support while you're performing the procedure. Uh, in actively listening to your patient in order to make sure that you're addressing any of their concerns or anxieties, making sure you're keeping an observation on their facial expressions and body language, because sometimes patients won't tell you that they're uncomfortable during a procedure. Making sure that your patient is actually still continuing to be comfortable, as comfortable as you can make them, and whether they've got any questions, making sure you continue to explain how much longer the procedure is going to be, using language and terminology that your patient can understand. If you've got any special instructions around um, things that you expect during the procedure, making sure that the patient knows those and is able to comply and understands. And where possible, if you can give positive instructions and feedback encouragement, rather than negative, for instance, saying, please keep still rather than don't move, um, sort of helps to set the context and keep this as a positive relationship. And then lastly, just remember that your patient, um, that you need to respect your patient's autonomy um, in the possibility that they might actually change their mind or want to pause or terminate the procedure if they don't want to continue with it. Now that we've completed the procedure or treatment, the next step is giving the patient information about their next steps and providing any aftercare instructions. Before we move on to the final step of discharging the patient, I want to talk to you about privacy and confidentiality. The standards of practice and code of ethics both have indicators around what the requirements are for registrants of CMRITO to preserve and protect the confidential information that is acquired through our professional relationship with patients. It's important that we keep that information confidential unless it's required to facilitate a diagnosis or treatment of the patient. Access to patient information is restricted to those involved in the patient's circle of care. So you can't access information for patients that you are not involved with in their circle of care simply out of curiosity or interest because that would violate the patient's privacy. You must also ensure that you maintain the confidentiality of patients and avoid discussing their patient care in a public setting even when no names are used. You must be sensitive that information other than a patient's name could really be used to identify a patient. The other place that's important to consider all of this is in social media for both your professional and personal perspectives, because posting information could result in a breach of patient information, confidentiality and privacy. 
So we've reached the final step in the time that you're going to be spending with your patient. You've completed your procedure or treatment, and it's time to discharge your patient. Remember to thank them for the time that they've had with you and confirm the next steps with them. If there's reports that are going to be generated, make sure they have a clear expectation on the timelines associated with that and ask if there's anything else you can do. It may be even as simple as directions to the parking garage. One of the quotes that I had found that I really love um, was this one, and it's from an unknown author. Um, Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. So be kind, always. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions that have arisen out of this presentation, please feel free to contact us at one of the numbers on the screen or by sending an email to our practice advice box. One of the members of our practice advice team will be happy to get back to you.